Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Father in heaven, we just come to you this morning. We open up our, our, uh, our Bibles this morning, Lord, and we just pray that we'd open up our hearts as well. Lord, we just pray that you'd use Pastor Lucy to speak to each one of us, Lord, to be encouraged. And speaking of encouragement, Lord, we just lift up our, our sister Dottie, and we just pray that you would um, lift up and encourage her, Lord, as her body is, is, is not working well. Lord, we just pray that you would lift her spirit, Lord, and encourage her at this time. We ask this now in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, for those of you who don't know Dottie, she was on our worship team up here, quite the spitfire. Just had her 88th birthday on the 10th of this month, so uh, she wanted to make sure you all knew that. And, uh, <laughs> you know, you're never supposed to ask a lady her age, I've been told, but when they volunteer it, that's, it's fair game then, you know, so it's all good. So, But we love dear Dot, and uh, we're sorry that her, her body is in pain. A- anyone else been struggling with pain in your body? This week, or sickness, we we have a lot of the this cold flu thing had made our way through through our family, made a nice route and knocked everyone. It, still there, joy's at home, and uh, we pre- cover your prayers, you know. And we should keep each other in, lifted up in prayer. Jesus said, "My Father's house is a house of what? A prayer for all nations." And we want to be a people of prayer. You know, some people say, "What does prayer do? What good is prayer?" And I I tell them, you know, honestly. Um, some people think prayer is a way that they make God do stuff. I'm going to s- suggest a different <laughs> approach to that. Is um, Prayer is more aligning yourself with the stuff God is doing. Because God is always at work doing things. And a lot of times we're just not quite in the right groove with what he's doing. And so when I go to prayer, it's, f- it's nice how the, the Lord takes control of the steering wheel of my life so to speak and steers me into the right groove you know sends me down the right track and so prayer is a great way to get in yourself aligned with what god is doing i really believe that that's why there is such great power in prayers because god is already powerful god is at work when you pray he goes let me put you right in that flow of my power what i'm doing and and into the into the move of what i'm doing and today we're going to see that God gave us His Holy Ghost, His Spirit, as a seal, to, uh, like a stamp of, of uh, a seal of protection, a seal that would cover us. And uh, I go, I'll go into it in more detail when we get to the verse. But today, we've we're, we got to li- pick up where we left off last week. If you look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, we just got through verse 12 where Paul had said, that when he was there in Corinth, remember he planted the church there. He was there for a year and a half as the, uh, on his missionary journey. He, he was the founding pastor of the church of Corinth. And so he said, when, when I was there with you, now, uh, just for those of you that are just joining us, if you didn't, just for a quick background, Corinth, um, in that day that we're writing about this biblical times, Corinth was li- kind of like the Las Vegas of the ancient world. The best way I can explain from everything I've read about them, the, you know, if you call someone a Corinthian, it was like a real knock. You, you're saying, you know, you're you're moralist, you're you're you know, you, you're wild in your lifestyle, you're a gambler, you're very very worldly, you know, or in all of the like kind of the loosest, not nicest sense of saying that. It's not it's not a compliment. If someone goes up and calls you a Corinthian, you you know. This is, that's not nice of you, you know. That's a, that's a mean thing to say. But that's what they used to use the word for, was to, to you know, s- describe a, a very promiscuous lifestyle, very, a very wild lifestyle. And God sent Paul to this wild place. You know, it's, it's like the, the, the guy God calls to go preach in Las Vegas on the Strip, you know. And he's there, and everyone's going, why are you here, mister? You know, this is a dark place. And it's because in the dark you need light. And God is light. And so Paul says, I was there with you. And he explained how he conducted himself. And Timothy that was with him, how those guys conducted themselves in front of 
this culture that was very worldly and, and you know, very promiscuous, very loose in their living. He says, this is how we conducted ourselves. Look at verse 12. He said, for our proud confidence is this, that the testimony of our conscience is that in holiness and in godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God, we have conducted ourselves in, in this world and especially towards you. Now, we had to end on this, but it's a, I don't know if any of you took this home and thought about it. How am I conducting myself in this world? You know, it, it, am I a light to those around me by my conduct, by my, my behavior? You know, do they look at you and say, wow, that person has such a godly sincerity. They, 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 they conduct themselves with, with a real, holiness means it set apart, separated for a, for a holy use, for a, a consecrated, godly use. Is, do they look at your life and say, that person is sold out and God, their, their, whole, their whole body, everything about them is just, God, here I am, it's all for you. Use me, here I am. Do they live like that? That's what Paul, Paul said that he, when he's writing the Corinthians, he says, when I was with you, I just lived out my life with, with, with sincerity, with a godly sincerity, with holiness in front of you. I showed you, this is what I like about Paul. He lived what he believed in front of the people. He wasn't one of those preachers who says, do as I say, but not as I do. You know, like, like the guy that, you know, you guys go be holy, I'm going to go live like the devil. That doesn't, that, Paul would give slap anybody like that today. I mean, he'd be straighten up you. That, that is not the way that preachers should live. But think about it. Do we have preachers like that in this present day? Yeah. And unfortunately, they give those of us that are trying to live in godly sincerity and in holiness, they give us a bad name. And I, I hope that when we ended last week, you took away with you that that last part that he said, that in the grace of God, not in fleshly wisdom did he conduct himself. He conducted himself in the grace of God. You know how, when people look at us, do they go, well, that person really conducts himself with grace. You know, what is, what is it to conduct yourself with grace? If you're a person that, you know, Paul said we were people that conducted ourselves with grace in front of you. How does grace actually, rubber meets the road kind of stuff. How, what, sh someone give me an example of, of using grace in a day-to-day -day application in, in, you know, say around your house with the family members. Well, first of all, what is grace? I mean, our church is called Amazing Grace. You should at least know what it means. Grace means unmerited what? Favor. Favor. It's unmerited. means um, you... Unmerit means you don't earn it. Like, like a merit badge in Scouts. I was a Boy Scout, an Eagle Scout, and we had to earn these little badges, you know, one for making a fire, one for tying knots, one for, you know, be repelling, different things. And we got these little patches after we completed the assignments and, and the tasks required and turned in our form. We earned, merited, they called, we merited those badges. You didn't get them for free. They didn't just go, here, you get the fire starting one. If you can't do the, if you can't start the fire nine different ways, you don't get the Eagle Scout one. You have to show that you can do it. You, you earn it. That's merited favor. You get that, you get that prize because you earned it. But grace is not something you earn. Grace, by definition, is unmerited favor. It means y you can't actually earn it it's a gift something you give to someone not because they earned it just because of your character you know God is a God of grace amazing grace and he loves us he loves us to overflowing and he there's great a lot of grace over there <laughs> so, at least they're, happy. Well, they're happy at least that's good yeah. so but grace from this that Paul says he conducted himself in his grace was, you know, that, that behavior that showed to people uh, a love, a caring, a giving to take care of someone without them earning it. You know, sometimes when we, we have our, well, every week we do the feeding that we do. We have a nice agape feast breakfast here. And uh, 
everyone is welcome to join in. And some of the people who aren't familiar with what we do, they'll come up and they go, what do I have to do to, to get some food? You know, like, do I have to help you do something or do I have to, to carry some boxes or do I have to rake or put it? And like, you don't have to do anything. You just come and receive. It's a gift. You can't earn it. It's just you. You don't have to earn something that's being given. You just get. It's it's a gift. It's free, freely given. And that's a person. Whenever you can conduct yourself in grace towards people, whenever you can have that cheerful. Now, by the way, Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. Not someone goes, oh, you again here. You're gonna have it, but uh, <laughs> you were here last week. What's the matter? Why didn't you get your life together? You know, that's not gracious. I've heard some people mumble. I want to just go up and gib slap them, you know. I wish I could just hear some grace for you, you know, and fix them up because they, they don't get it. Grace is, God, God has lavished on all of us. Salvation, the greatest of gifts, was given to us, it says, by grace, through faith. Not, not of works, lest any man should what? Boast. Not single one of us can boast I earned God's favor. I earned that he'd give me this. No. It was a gift. Paid for by God through the blood of his, own, his only begotten son, Jesus. And so we can't boast. We just received it as a gift. And because we received such a great gift of grace from God, we can now turn and share that grace with others. So last week I ended that Paul was conducting himself with grace when he was amongst all of these people in this real worldly, worldly society. Does it pay to have grace in a worldly society? Yes, it does. It's how you be a light in this world. Remember, Jesus said, we're, we're to be in this world, but we're not to be what? Of this world. Now, I've used this example many a time, but... Being a teacher like I am, I got visual aids for you. Would you look over here to the ocean? We have this, this, this ocean will just be the, 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 the water in the ocean to represent the world. And that boat, see the boat skimming by over there? I brought that in for visual aid, except he's going the wrong way. Turn around, I want to show everybody. It's okay, you see the boat? Well, we, we'll use a different one. Way out yonder, there's another boat. Now that boat, both of them, and even the one farther beyond, if you've got good eyes like me, you can see the little one way on the horizon. Oh, and then another one. All those boats are made to be in the water. There's not a problem with a boat being in the water, is there? What's the problem when the water gets into the boat? If you don't have a bilge pump, that's that little device at the bottom that flips on, like kind of like how a toilet flapper works. It comes on when the water level rises in the bottom of the boat, and it pumps it out. And if you don't get the water out of the boat constantly and keep that boat dry, you're going to have a problem because boats, though they're designed to be in water, they are not designed to have the water in the boat. And as Christians, you were designed to be in this world, but you're not designed to have this world in you. Okay? You, you, does that make sense? You, you are made to be in this world. You're like a lifeboat to somebody next to you. You're gonna, God's going to bring you into someone's life and you'll be like that lifeboat. Um, oh, what are those guys, the Coast Guard, you know, come rolling up and throw out the thing and send them, the, throw the little, the little floaty rings to them and save the people that are drowning. Your life is made to be like that. But the problem is, is a lot of Christians aren't conducting themselves the way Paul said he conducted himself in holiness, in a separated, consecrated way, in godly sincerity, and in the grace of of God, not in fleshly wisdom. Okay, there's a difference too in that. And I hated ending, sorry, I kind of felt like I cut short last week because how many of us sometimes operate with the wisdom of the flesh? You know, we, it, it, we wouldn't want to even admit it, but, you know, I grew up in a Sicilian upbringing and unfortunately I learned a few fleshly mannerisms, you know, ways that like, kind of like, just even the way we conducted ourselves in business. For those of you who don't know about the Sicilian way of doing business, we, we, we will graciously do favors for you. But guess what? We have a little log. And we keep track. And we remember that we did that favor for you. And there will be a day 
when we'll call in that favor, because see, once we give you a favor, you now owe us. Th this is not grace, by the way. Grace gives freely, no conditions, no strings attached. But that's not what I was brought up with. I was brought up with fleshly wisdom. Every time you do someone a good favor, now they owe you something. And if you do enough favors for them, now they owe you something big. You know, you just sum them up. That's fleshly wisdom. Paul said, we didn't conduct ourselves like that with you. We conducted ourselves in grace. Grace. Unmerited favor. You didn't deserve anything we gave to you, but we gave it to you freely. No strings attached. It's a gift. Because God has given us grace. You know, if you, if you say, well, but I'm not good at this grace thing. I, you know, well, then what you need to study is how gracious has God been to you. How much sin did he forgive of yours? How much? All. I'm seeing mouths going, all. That's correct. All. How much sin should you forgive of your spouse? Some of you are going, most, some. He was a jerk this week. You don't understand, Pastor. I haven't checked my book. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't checked my book, she says. <laughs> Listen, all is all. Forgive us our sins, Jesus said when you pray. Ask the Father. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who, what? Trespass against us. Do you all know that that's a loaded prayer? I don't know if you thought this through. This is dangerous. You say, God, forgive me as I forgive those that have sinned against me. Only I don't forgive that jerk. So God, don't, what did you just pray? You said you didn't forgive him, so God goes, okay, I don't forgive you. You asked him, forgive me as I am, well, you're not forgiving, so as you're not forgiving, so God, don't for Jesus, and if you don't believe me, you read Matthew chapter 6, go to the end, and you see Jesus goes on and he says, the only part of the, of the Lord's Prayer that Jesus comments on in Matthew 6 is the part about the forgiveness. He says, for if you forgive men their sins, so will your Father in heaven forgive you. But if you do not forgive men, what does it, what, what did Jesus say? Your Father in heaven will what? Not forgive you. It's loaded, guys. When we want forgiveness, we have to give forgiveness. And I don't know about you, but I want all the forgiveness I can get. I want the whole package. I want the whole enchilada. I want all my sins forgiven. So I need to be a person that walks, like Paul said, conducting myself not in fleshly wisdom, but in grace. And i got to be forgiving of those people that sin against me. Because I want God's forgiveness. Now, Paul goes on, he says, to these folks, he says, For we write nothing else to you than what you read and you understand. And I hope, he says, you will understand until the end. For just as you all sh also partially did understand us, that we are your reason to be proud as you also are our reason to be proud in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, in this confidence, I intended to come to you, uh, he says at first, but so that you might receive twice a, a blessing. That, that is to pass your way into Macedonia and then again from Macedonia to come to you and by you be helped on my journey to Judea. So, Paul says, I was so hoping I'd get to see you on this, on this pass going that way. And when I come back, I get to see you twice. You know, like, because, I mean, this is a church he planted. You, you got to understand, there's relationships that have developed with these folks there. And he's like, I, wa I want to come see you guys on my way going and on my way coming back and, and, and receive a blessing of hanging out with you. And verse 17, he says, therefore, he says, I was not vacillating when I was intending to do this, was I? Or what, or, or what I purpose, do I purpose according to the flesh? So that with me there will be yes and, and, and there will be yes and a no at the same time? He said, no. But as God is faithful, our word to you is not yes and no. He says, for the Son of God, Christ Jesus, who was preached amongst you by us, by me and Salvinius and Timothy, it was not yes and no, but it is yes in him. For as many are the promises of God in him, they are yes, and therefore also through him is our amen to the glory of God through us. 
Now he who establishes us with you is Christ, and who has anointed us is God, who, and who has sealed us and gave us the Spirit in our hearts as a pledge. He says, we, we wanted to come. Now, there obviously from the clues you can read here, did Paul get to make it on that particular journey that he had hoped to go? No, he must have, something must have come up. And they were going, wait a minute, this guy said he was coming, but then he didn't come. So is his yes mean no, and his no mean yes? And remember what Jesus said, let your yes be yes, let your no be no. Anything beside this is what? Is evil. You don't have to swear. I swear, I swear. Why do people always go, I swear to God, I'm telling you the truth this time, I swear. Okay, if you have to swear to God that you're telling me the truth this time, what were you telling me last time? Can I believe what you said? I mean, if you're a person of your word, your yes is yes and your no is no, you don't even need to swear. Because just the, your character is always the same. I, I share this because I had a grandfather who I was named after who never, ever, I never saw him say ever, I swear. He just said, I'll be there. If he could be there, he said, I'd be there. If he couldn't, I can't be there. His yes was yes, his no was no. He was a man of his word. I mean, he'd have to be dead. If, if he said to somebody, I'll be there tomorrow at 5 to help you on that job. He, he was a master tile setter. If he said, I'll be there tomorrow at 5 to, uh, a.m. to help you. I'm telling you, he'd have to have died to not be there. Something would have to go. He was a man of his word. If he said it, he'd do it. And that's a great, that's for I know it sounds weird, but I'm so grateful I grew up with an example like that. Because in this culture today, a lot of the kids are going, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. Nobody says what they mean. Nobody says yes and no and that's it. And it means, I mean, it's, it's convoluted. It's not correct. And Paul, obviously, he had heard word that they're going, you said you were coming, but you were not coming. Now, Listen, when you're in the ministry and you want to go visit everyone, like just part of your heart is with those people that you helped in the gospel and those ones over there. And I know when Jan and I just had the privilege to go with our kids to the mainland for uh, Bill, Jan's brother, uh, finished 30 years of military service. So we went to his commencement. And uh, when we were done, my other brother-in-law said, if you'll just fly to Arizona instead of fly back to Hawaii, you're already in Washington. That's close, you know. Seattle's closer than, than, so he's like baiting me. Just fly here and I'll pay to fly you home. <laughs> okay, so we go. But you know what's interesting? As soon as we get to Arizona, Jan, of course, she did the little FaceTime post. We were going on our way to Arizona. We get to Arizona, people are already calling us. You're in Arizona, come see us. We want you to come see us. Can we visit with you? Can, and it was really nice because, I mean, from from my heart, those are some of the folks I hadn't seen for 30 plus years. And some of those ones actually prayed over us when we, when we came out here to plant the church 26 years ago. So we got to touch base with some of those folks and my heart was torn. I wanted to go around like all over the place and see a whole bunch of people because, you know, it's just, I don't know, it's just the heart of a, a pastor. You, you, you've spent time sowing into those people's spiritual journeys from many years ago. And it's very exciting to hear that some of them have gone on and continued on in the faith. I, I know what, what John said, it's such a joy when, when, as a pastor when you hear that, that those ones that you, that you had the privilege of introducing to the Lord have continued on and continue to grow in the faith. It's like, ah, oh, so good for the heart. On the flip side, it kind of stinks when you hear that ones that were going real strong have shipwrecked little too much water got into their boat and they went down. And they're no longer serving the Lord. They're backslidden and man, your heart, to, my heart is aching over hearing about some of the ones that are, you know, they used to be just, they used to help me in Sunday school with the kids. Like, you can't backslide. You were a Sunday school teacher. You know, that's why I want to stop that. But I can understand that what Paul is you know, feeling here, he wanted to go back to see them on the way, and then he wanted to pass back through on his way back to GD. He, he, you know, many are the plans of a pastor's heart. Well, any man's heart, the scripture says, right, in Proverbs. Many are the plans of a man's heart, but the Lord does what? Directs our steps. 
That was one of my brother Joseph's favorite verses. He always would uh, point that out because he had a lot of plans. He was a master planner. He was, he was like, he could think up a billion different businesses. If you needed someone to dream up new business ideas, my brother was your guy. He just had that ability to look out and go, you know, we could make a business to start blowing up tires for people on the side of the road that maybe their tires are a little underinflated or maybe they got fun. We'll just make a business that just goes, drives around and helps people on the side of the road. And um, maybe we'll carry some spare heater hoses. And this is in Arizona, of course, you know, and some extra water for them when they overheat in the desert. And, and then, we, you know, this is before the days of bottled water. He's like, we could carry ice water in a thermos and some cups and... We could go help people, and he'd, he'd be like, you can, and, and, and as soon as he finished that idea, he'd springboard to another one, and another one, and the ideas just flowed, and I'd be like, wow, this is great, but his, it's interesting to me that he keyed in on that proverb, that many are the plans of a man's heart, but it's the Lord that directs our steps. And I know Paul was just, he, he's going to go on. And next week I'm going to go into more detail about the plan because he, he actually explains kind of the motive why the plan didn't. He, he, didn't, he didn't get to do his plan. But it did, he, he wasn't saying, I didn't want to come to you. He's going to actually explain why it didn't work out for him to come in the next chapter, the end of this chapter into the next chapter. But it's a whole study, so I'm going to save that for next week. For this week, I want to ask you, are you, are you conducting yourself in grace? What we started off with this morning, are you, you know, if people are around you, do they feel like, wow, that person is so, such a blessing to be around, you know, they're just so filled with the grace of God. And, and does your behavior have that, that mark, what Paul was talking about, that godly sincerity, that that holiness. Are you walking in a manner that is separated from the worldly ways of walking? Like when, when people listen to your speech, are they like, well, he swears just like any other truck driver. That's not holiness of speech. That's, you know, worldliness. Paul said he didn't conduct himself in worldly, fleshly ways. He conducted himself in godly sincerity and holiness and in the grace of God. Are we doing that in our lives, in, in the things that we do? And are we realizing that, well, as Paul said here, God has established us in Christ. And then he said in verse 21, and he has anointed us. Anointed means, well, it's, a, it's an empowering term. It's when they used to take the oil and pour it over the high priest to anoint him with that oil. What was the oil representative in the Old Testament? Do you guys know? The Holy Spirit, that's right, the Holy Ghost. They would pour the oil over the priest and they would and they would anoint him and they would pray. And God would empower that man to serve in that office of the priesthood. To go for the people, on behalf of the people, he would go and he would give an offering every year. Now I wouldn't want the high priest job back in the Old Testament days. So you, you guys know what they used to do? They used to tie a rope around his ankle. They used to put bells around the hem of his garment. You know why? Because he was carrying in the offering into the holy place. They had the tabernacle with the holy of holies in the back. And he was going to go bring in an offering once a year for the people of this, uh, for the entire nation as, a, uh, as an offering for sin. If God wasn't pleased with the offering, oh, by the way, he carried in an offering for himself first on top of the offering for the people. If God wasn't pleased, God would smite the guy dead. They'd have to, you know, if they didn't, if they gave a little tug and it didn't go tug back, they'd just drug him out. I wouldn't want that job. And yet Jesus came to be our high priest in the book of Hebrews who would give the sacrifice once for all. But he would go in and he would die. He would die for us. He would be the substitutionary death for us. Our high priest really paid the price. Wow. But he did it and he said, guys, don't be afraid. I'm going to go to the Father now. But I'm going to send you the Holy Ghost. And he is going to, he's going to give you all that you need. 
He's going to anoint you. He's going to comfort you. He's going to bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. You know, you never really have to work hard to remember the things of the Lord if you have the Holy Spirit. Now, some of you go, well, how do I know if I have it? But, by the way, if you're asking that question, that's a great question. But you do need to make sure you have the Holy Ghost. It's not something that I, you know, say to, say to you lightly, hey, this thing of the Holy Spirit is like something you should, you know, read about but not experience. It's something you should, you, you want to experience because this, this gift of the Holy Ghost, this is the thing Paul says that seals us. Seals us until the day of redemption, he writes in the book of Ephesians. And this spirit is given to us as a, well, into our hearts as a pledge. God says, this is now my property. And, I, and I'm giving an earnest deposit in another passage in the scripture. God says, my earnest deposit, my down payment to make sure you know that I'm coming back for this is my Holy Ghost. How do you know God's coming back for you? Because he gave us his Holy Spirit. And you say, but how do I know if I have his Holy Spirit? Do you remember when, when we went over this, the, the founding of this church? Remember, Paul was back in the book of Acts. He had gone there. And what do you guys believe in? Huh? We believe in um, um, baptism for repentance of sins. You know, John the Baptist taught that. And he goes, that's great. Um, did any of you guys get um, hear about Jesus yet? <laughs> Uh, no, we haven't got to that part yet. Did you guys get to hear about the Holy Spirit? You know, because he asked, did you guys receive the Holy Spirit when you were baptized? He said, we don't even know if there is a Holy Spirit. Now, isn't that interesting that Paul would write to them and say, you guys, you guys. Now, he'd already been with them for a year and a half, so he's made sure that they know about the Holy Spirit. But you guys were sealed by God's Spirit. It was given into your heart as a pledge. And he's faithful. And he establishes you now. He anoints you. He's the one who, who seals you with his spirit. What a comfort this is to me. I don't know about you. Anyone else comforted with the idea that God's spirit seals you? When I, when I teach this to the kids, by the way, I just tell them, they go, what does it mean seal? I go, it's kind of like um, an invisible force field. Because they all seem to know about force fields, you know, and some, so through some, you know, I don't know, anime or something, you know, they can picture a force. Just picture that God comes into you and now you have his Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost generated force field around your life. You're sealed. You're protected by God. They go, oh, I get it. But that's what happens when you give your life to Christ. And you say, I, I want that. You know, Paul, Paul went, and well, we know what happened there in the book of Acts. He said, you guys didn't know about Jesus? Hey, let me tell you the rest of the story. And then he lays hands on them, and he prays for them. By the way, if you want prayer for that, hey, Herb, are you up for praying for someone for the Holy Ghost today? Herb, Herb that guy has the Holy Spirit too. All you need is, and by the way, some of you believers already have the Holy Spirit. Maybe you're going to be around someone who is, they have, it's, just like in the days of court, they didn't know about it, they, but they, wa they want it. What do you do for them? What do you do if somebody says, I want that, and, and you're like, oh, it's, fr it's a free gift. How, how, how did Paul pass that gift on to those guys? says he laid hands on them, and he prayed over them. You know, it's amazing that just the power of God can flow through our, a touch of our hand. You know, isn't that cool how the Lord does that? Something, just that simple act of, of just obedience. You know, they would put the oil on the priest and the, and the power of God would come on him. They would, Paul would go, here you go, and he would just touch the person and, this, and the power of God. Remember they were stealing his handkerchiefs? Because the sick were, 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 were sick and they go, well, Paul touched this. And they, re you know, what's interesting to me is they actually recognized the power of God could pass through any object if that person had touched it. So <laughs> he wipes himself off with his, we call a sweat rag in our, you know, like, he, I can just see him, he, whew, man, it's so hot. Wipes it off and he, he sets it down and someone goes, ooh, Paul touched that, get it. He's preaching, someone, shoop, there goes his hanky, you know. 
and they run it over to the sick person, and they go, Paul touches, here. And they drop it on the sick person, and the sick person is made well. You go, oh. because they recognize the power of God can flow such, through such a simple thing. You know, I think in modern Christianity, we, we overcomplicated the whole thing. We, we had to go back to the simplicity of how Jesus did it. You know, remember the, the little one? He goes, bring that little one to me. And he, they were like, no, don't, don't bother the teacher. And he just brings him right up, sits him in his lap. Don't forbid the little children coming to you. We just got to come to Jesus like a child and say, here I am, Lord, touch me. Right? And that's all it takes. It, we, we should, if we really want to see the power of God manifested in our lives, we have to just do those simple acts of obedience. I saw my son during the worship time lay hands on one of the men who, whose shoulder's been hurt, and he just said, can I pray for you? Right when we were doing worship, I was watching. I, I was deaf for a lot of years, so I learned to read lips. Be careful. I can tell what you're saying. But, um, but he was praying over the fellow right, right, right there by the sound box and, uh, for his shoulder. And I was thinking, how cool is this? You know, because the guy was like, thank you. I needed that. You know, God, all it took was a simple act of obedience just to touch the person and pray for them. So if you want the Holy Ghost, if you're not sure, if you if you've never experienced it for certain, you want to make sure. Herb, you up for that today? Look at two thumbs up, man. That guy will pray for you. That's our chaplain at the hospital. He got the Holy Ghost. I have the Holy Ghost. We got Aaron. We got a couple of us. Anyone else willing to join in? We'll pray over you. And if you just need the Lord to touch you, like maybe your body is hurting. Maybe you need a, a prayer for healing, you know, or, or, or a broken heart. Can God mend broken hearts? Every week I see him do it. But we, we make, we, we, we hold, guys, we should be just praying. And it, it's something like, but that person did something stupid. They deserve a broken heart. Wow, that's really full of grace. <laughs> so glad you had amazing grace today. Come on. We've all done stupid stuff that got us in bad ways. But it doesn't mean we don't need God's grace to touch us to get us back on track, right? So let's be the people that live and conduct ourselves in grace and in godly sincerity. Let's do what Paul was saying. And I'll point out next week the whole thing of, yes, he had a plan. Does the plan always go the way we want? No. But there's some other things he brings to light that he recognizes God wove into the picture that he might not have been. That always God does this in our lives. We, we get, we've got a great plan. We're going to work the plan. And God goes, you're leaving out a few things. You know, and then he shows us in his kind ways those things. So don't, don't feel weird if you've made plans and it hasn't all worked out. It even happened to the Apostle Paul. And right here in Corinth, uh, in Second Second Corinthians, it's recorded for us. Next week we'll go into the details. Go ahead and read ahead if you have time. But for right now, let's just be the people that go to God and say, "God, give us that what we need from Your Spirit, that we can go from here and be a light in our community." Would you join me in that prayer, Father in heavens? I thank you so much for the privilege that we get to study Your Word on a beach in Hawaii, and I pray, Lord. As we go from here, the words that we have visited and the parts we have even revisited, Lord, these things would not fall on deaf ears, Lord, but they would fall on ears that would be able to hear and, and, and to be able to apply, Lord, that we could be a people filled with grace, Lord, that we could be a people filled with your forgiveness. Lord, as we truly want your forgiveness in our lives, help us forgive those that have sinned against us. To let it all go that we could be freed. and Fill us to overflowing, I pray. I pray anointing would be upon Herb over there at the table as he prays over anyone who would want the, that touch from your Holy Spirit to make sure they have it. Lord, just may it pour forth this day onto those that need that touch, that sealing and comfort of your Spirit. And Lord, I thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the power that your Holy Spirit has that can work in our lives and we ask it would work now men broken hearts men broken bodies lord and 
Lord, even the ones that are at home sick right now for our dear Auntie Dot, we just pray for her, that you would bring comfort to her heart, Lord. I know she wants to go home to be with you. But if you, if you want to take her, Lord, send some nice handsome angels to go pick her up and, and bring her home into your, into your loving arms. I, I, I keep telling her, don't take cuts, but she's pretty persistent. So, Lord, just give her, make her goings easy when it's that day. And until then, just continue to use her as you have used her, Lord, as a bright light for your gospel. Thanks, Lord, for, for one that would shine so bright in her age. And help us all to shine bright for you this week. I ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people who agreed said, Amen. Amen. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo, and God bless.